what it means to uh, biophysics uh, in general. And the uh, fourth one is going to be uh, by Dr. Muliel, who is uh, an epidemiologist, very renowned epidemiologist uh, in Christian Medical College, uh, Vellore. He's going to tell us about uh, this epidemiology. Basically, what we have is now a pandemic. So pandem uh, uh, it's epidemiology is for an epidemic. Pandemiology is for the pandemic. He's going to tell us. Uh, so we are alternating between contemporary topics and uh, somewhat technically sophisticated topics by both rising young researchers and also very senior accomplished uh, researchers as well. That way, we connect to the past. I also we connect to the future because young people are the ones who are going to tell us what uh, the future is going to look like. And from senior people, we are going to learn how the world is today and how it has been in the past. So we want to alternate these things. And uh, if any of you have suggestions for speakers, we are open to take those suggestions. So every month we'll have two. And uh, we are starting the uh, first talk today in this uh, webinar series. So with that uh, uh, short introduction, I would like to request uh, our, our organizers, uh, uh, Professor Revati uh, of IT Palaka and Professor Sunil Malagi of uh, BMS College of Engineering uh, in Bangalore here. They have done the hard, hard work to put together this webinar series. I request one of them to introduce today's speaker and start the seminar. Thank you all for uh, attending. The number is 96. It's going to become three digits very quickly. Uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, sir. Yeah. Uh, so I welcome all the participants uh, who has uh, registered for this uh, IEEE public lecture series. Uh, sir has already given you the introduction about the IEEE and how the series will be ca carried out. So I would like to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Chandrasekhar uh, Prajapati. Dr. Chandrasekhar Prajapati received his uh, BSc degree in 2007 and uh, Master of Science degree in Physics in 2009 from Kanpur University, India. He completed his uh, doctoral uh, studies in 2013 from Motilal Nehru National Institute of Technology, Allahabad. He was a postdoctoral fellow at uh, SENSE at the Indian Institute of Science from uh, uh, 2014 to 18. He was also a visiting researcher at KTH Royal Institute of Technology, Sweden. Since April 2018, he is working as a DST Inspire faculty at Center for uh, Electronics and Nanoscience Engineering, Indian Institute of uh, Science, Bangalore. His areas of interest are mainly chemical gas sensors for air quality monitoring leakage monitoring and breath analyzer to his credit he has published 23 international journals five conference papers and two patents so i welcome dr chandrasekhar prajapati uh, to deliver the talk and uh, i hand over mic to dr chandrasekhar prajapati yeah thank you so much uh, thank you sunil for nice introduction uh, so i hope i am audible to all so i can proceed now uh, yeah, you're very much audible, sir. Yes. You can go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. So uh, so today in this uh, first talk for a one hour, what we are going to talk about, I'll just break down the title of my talk into the pieces so that uh, general public can, you know, understand as Professor Anand has said. So uh, here, if you see, we are going to talk about indigenously developed gas sensor technology for various applications. So you can... Uh, see the word indie it, it, it you can understand like we now talk about the indie docs we should adopt the indie docs like indian docs so it's basically the indian made technology what we have developed here and uh, for gas sensors so uh, you all must be using lpg gas in your kitchen right that is one of the gas and if that gas leak is unfortunately it can catch the fire and it can harm, of course, that property. So, uh, so for LPG gas, there is a limit. It's called LEI limit, lower exposure limit. If the gas concentration in that particular kitchen or room is less than of some amount, it won't catch the fire. But it will reach to certain amount where it is prone to catch the fire, 
right so so there is a for each and every gases that is le and and uh, uel limit uel is that upper exposure limit you can even google that these terms if you are unable to you know catch that right so there are different gases some are toxic some are non toxic and some are inflammable gases so we develop the gas sensors kind of a device which can detect the gases in the environment right so for a, for example lpg in a kitchen if if there is a leakage of uh, the lpg the device which is sitting very close to that cylinder can give you a alarm and it's it's very early alarm kind of indication for you there is a leak has happened in the kitchen and you have to take the actions right so it it is so gas sensors used for safety purposes and as a title said it is used for air quality monitoring like what kind of air we are breathing in right whether you can understand that co2 is keep increasing so how to monitor the co2 level so this device if you put it outside it can tell the co2 level how it is increasing and how it is decreasing leak detection right leak detection the best example as i said is the lpg gas right and different gases like hydrogen there are many many inflammable gases are there and the third term is the breath analysis right so uh, we will see uh, in this presentation what is the breath analysis basically what i'm trying to say in that you inhale uh, oxygen as you understand oxygen is important and there is a certain amount of gases comes out from your breath and what you can do with that sample what breath which is coming out what what you are exhaling out right so we will see uh, in this presentation the air quality monitoring system what we have developed from the scratch and for the leak detection that those systems and you can see some pictures over here these are some systems we have developed at sense in last 6 uh, uh, to 7 years and this is the air quality monitoring monitoring uh, system what we have developed this is for the leak detection i'll tell the more detail and here it is one of the device uh, is it can tell the breath uh, concentration level basically this device is done for h2s detection you'll see the detail now so uh, with that uh, the outline of my talk is you know we all understand that uh, uh, that many components like transistor you know and uh, pn junction diode different things is reached to the mature level no need to do lot of research on that there a lot of uh, components are already available sorry already available in the market we can buy that so sensor basically nothing but is a electronic interface what you have and the gas sensor chip this these both goes to into this systems and we develop a gas sensor system so uh, there a lot of research has already happened in this direction and so uh, i will be talking about more on the gas sensor chip part we'll see how we fabricated the chip from the scratch and how do we package what all the challenges during the fabrication what all the challenges during the packaging and what all the challenge during the calibration and what all the challenges uh, when we deploy these uh, devices in outside world you know how, what kind of data we get and how we understand that this device is performing well okay so it's just like a fabrication you make the bread in the kitchen right how how good quality bread you are making in the kitchen so how good quality device you are making right and how well you are packaging i mean so that it is stable and the calibration uh, term we will understand little more when we go in, into the slides right now and the field deployment any system when you develop until unless you don't put in a field in the real world application uh, uh, application you may not able to understand how good device or bad devices uh, you made okay so this is overall outline of this talk so more on we will emphasize uh, about this gas sensor chip and how we package this and how we are going to utilize uh, how we utilize in the field okay so this is a typical uh, pcb you mounted all the components and then you mounted gas sensor components all together and and and, and you basically add them and make a systems so there are the different application as i said uh, we have uh, primarily worked on the leak detection systems we have worked on uh, outdoor air quality monitoring systems and some oral hygiene as i said so we are exploring currently indoor and uh, some automobiles part and ventilator and how we can utilize the gas sensors in these three fields so uh, today i i i i talk about more on leak detection and we see what all the devices we fabricated 
and in case of uh, outdoor what kind of device or system we made it and how how good data we are getting and in uh, case of s2s sensors how we are detecting the s2s gas and how well it is what is the uh, uh, outcome of those systems so if you see the basics of uh, gas detection technology what we have is we have optical based technology we have uh, electrochemical based technology we have semiconductor based technology so what we work majorly on semiconductor based technology semiconductor based gas uh, uh, detection technology so there are the, for each and every techniques there are some uh, advantages or uh, some disadvantages right so before we start any any research we always look at the history and see that you know what kind of pros and cons of this system and if there are some some disadvantages how we are going to overcome so say the uh, some disadvantages of semiconductor based technology is that uh, the sensitivity the, the sensitivity of these these devices if you make uh, using some oxides are, are are related to temperature and moisture variation so how how we overcome that that we'll see and these uh, uh, gas sensor device are are not very good uh, uh, in selectivity uh, actually the selectivity means is if let's say you have 10 gases in the environment and you want to detect the number 1 gas so how other nine gases are doing the kind of interference to the sensor one signal so that if it's very good uh, ratio like your your first sensor what you made for is detecting very high sensitivity and others are very low interference then you can say that the develop system is good for this particular gas not for other gases so that's how the selectivity uh, we choose for uh, semiconductor based devices the advantage we should keep in mind that we can make very small chip and uh, we can do ultra low power chip so that nowadays you can see that it typically are using the mobile is running with the battery right so uh, it, it, so how you can make any component which goes into the system which utilize very low power could be of microwatt could be of nanowatt so this all depends on how you do the design of a chip and and so that you can reduce the power and if you reduce the size of this uh, chip you ultimately can uh, reduce the power and you know increase the functionality of it long life and the low cost of course when you miniaturize and combine all devices uh, all together very densely packed you can definitely uh, uh, reduce the cost of it and if you make it in mass production of course you can bring the the cost dust kill with that uh, we will understand how uh, this gas sensor journey started the evolution of gas sensors basically so if you look at around 18 19 centuries uh, we had coal as a source uh, uh, for a fuel you can say that so when the person goes into the uh, coal mines when they try to dig the coal that the different gases comes out and when the people started dying there inside that coal mines they understand that there something unpleasant or very toxic is present there in the coal mines so what we can do how to detect it so they they developed a kind of invented a dewey lamp which is nothing but the plume of that uh, lamp is decreased based on the gas concentration inside the coal mine same as they used a canary bird so what happens uh, when there is a, some concentration is changing this canary bird is a singing bird right so it, it the pitch of this bird changes with the change of the concentration of the oxygen what is there inside the coal so later when the person get more brilliant and you know around 20th century 19th century they started digging more into the science and then they come up with metal oxide based gas sensors and that's how we started the whole journey of gas gas sensor system development when the uh, person uh, became more intelligent they started coming to the technology and adopting the technology to make the life easier Right. So with that, uh, what, what is the problem if if we have if we see the low level of oxygen in the environment? So what you can see this chart over here, which says that when you go from zero percent oxygen to hundred percent oxygen, right? You generally take around twenty twenty one percent of oxygen. If if there is a low level of oxygen, what happens? Uh, uh, to run a body, to run a cells in your body, you need a certain amount of oxygen that is. 20.9 or 21% right if the oxygen level is decreasing in your body you know your, your body is not going to functional 
right? So you need that certain amount of uh, oxygen. It's best example when you you know uh, go to very uh, you can say high altitude places like Himalayas and all. You carry the cylinders. Those are oxygen cylinders, so that you can have twenty one percent level of oxygen what you are breathing in, so that you can survive at that place. Right? So this is uh, the 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 kind of you know uh, problem when you have low level of oxygen in the environment. Other problem is is if you have some toxic gases in the environment, right? Uh, so there, the, as I said, that for inflammable gases which can catch the fire, like LPG, you know, there is a level is called LEL level, like low exposure level. Same for toxic gases, there are different levels are there. How much minimum level of toxic gases is uh, a kind of permissible? Is it like is allowed? In the environment, so for each case, it's a different different ratio, or different different levels are there. So here, the, this graph is trying to say that is if you have carbon monoxide gas, right? And uh, here you can see carbon monoxide in parts per million, and the uh, the period of exposure, how long you are going to expose. So if let's say if you expose to uh, 10 minutes for 500 ppm gas, you are okay. I mean, you can start feeling that unwell condition. So this graph is trying to say when you kind of inhale it for longer time, you will kind of die, right? So that, that, that's a problem of like, that's why you call it the toxic gases. Okay. So for that applications, you need to have a gas sensor, gas sensor system, which can alert you that there is a presence of uh, toxic gases at very early stage, somewhere at here, when you are not even reaching to this stage at all, right? So the gas sensor should work very so from here we understand all the parameter first parameter it should react i mean it's kind of it should indicate very fast right if it's let's say indicating after 20 minutes there is no point of having the sensor around us right it should it should you know uh, uh, alert you at very very beginning stage so that you can take the actions so that that's a role or that's the application of gas sensor or gas sensor systems i would say now, if we go to uh, very uh, basics of uh, this metal oxide semiconductor, uh, how the physics and all chemistry works there, you have n-type semiconductor, you have p-type semiconductor. In case of n-type semiconductor, electron list, you have more of the electron there. So what happens when you uh, expose these metal oxides in the air and you heat it at certain temperature, you have oxygen around that is around 21 percent so that oxygen basically comes and react on the surface and takes the electron from the system i mean to say system here that your metal oxides it takes the electron from the uh, uh, metal oxides and make very highly resistive region around this so this is you can say it's a one of the grain here and then when there is a, a gas presence that i mean let's say you want to detect this co gas right and when this, this gas come and react on the surface, on the surface here, what happens? You have CO plus O2 minus. This is the oxygen species, which is adsorbed on the surface. So this gas, this is my uh, desired gas, which I want to detect. This gas react with this uh, uh, ionic species, you know, uh, and then this convert into CO2, for example, here, right? And it will release this electron, which was already at job, right? So this is uh, uh, going to release this electron here. This is the kind of chemical reaction, uh, you know. So this electron goes back into the system. So what happens initially, there is a resistance. Let's say if you see that time versus the resistance plot, this is R, this is T here. You know, initially you have this resistance, right? And when this gas cup came here, this CO gas came here, it changes the resistance let's say so in this this is kind of an indication the change of resistance or current uh, from this metal oxides is indicator for a gas presence different ways. so this reaction is just just i said for example so there are many uh, gases are there and for every gas there is a different chemical reactions are there right same uh, applicable for p type uh, oxides right so you can even Google that and you can understand what I'm talking about here uh, in more detail. So uh, if, if we try to understand from the Fermi level point of view, then initially when there is a, a 
absorption of oxygen species have been on that right so you have like uh, deficiency of electron you are basically you have high potential barrier at the, this 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 reason and when the gas comes and again this potential where you know uh, is com coming down so in the, the change of this uh, uh, is bring down the resistance change and you can see that this is the indication for the gas presence that's how the uh, most of the metal oxide gas system uh, works right in detail now so for each gas sensor i mean for each kind of technology you know there is a road map it's just like uh, if you are familiar with the transistor journey that you have more slow and also try to reduce down the size you can uh, you know kind of pack or most of the transistor in very small space or area so same for gas sensor there is a road map right and this roadmap is published by the youth they basically conduct the research and uh, and try to compile all the data and see where the gas sensor uh, uh, technology is going on so they, they they said that they kind of predicted that long back that in 2020 they could not predict that this kind of pandemic pandemic is going to happen but yes in the technology they predicted that in 2000 2020 we are going to encounter such such kind of sensors which may have the power reduction from 100 watt to all the way to tens of milliwatt the chip which were using power of 100 milliwatt in 2020 when we have more advanced uh, technology then the power requirement will be tens of milliwatt same for die size the size from few millimeter square, it will go down to sub millimeter square. You can say from millimeter to micrometer, you can say. And if you are having some sensor like single or double sensor on a chip, you may come up with a combo sensor which will have all sensor together on its one system so that you can save the space, power, and a lot of other stuff. The accuracy, uh, accuracy is that how much minimum level of gas change in an atmosphere sensor can detect so if it is uh, uh, in case of let's say for lpg let's you see that one percent two percent three percent are there right so if it is able to uh, detect very low level i mean let's say one percent is okay if it is there is change from one to one point one percent of lpg in the air and the sensor basically giving the alarm and is able to detect and able to process the signal and giving the indication to you is well and good right so if if let's say it is giving within 1.1 percent if let's say it's giving within two percent like one to two then one percent is accuracy i mean this much of change uh, plus minus of this much change it can detect accurately so uh, so, so the, the accuracy should go from ppm level to the ppb level very small small change you should be able to detect broadly you can understand that so we are going to have uh, uh, one more thing was missing is the cost of it they could they did not predict so what we did we kind of extrapolated this and we told that the cost must also go down to from let's say tens of dollar to few of dollars so that everyone can buy and make the system and you know deploy in a field for their own uh, safety purposes right so we kind of extrapolated this this cost part here so we want these all thing together in a one chip right? in 2020 so this was a kind of roadmap we had long back and we thought to yes it's very good and we kind of worked in this direction and we'll see what we achieved so if if some of those who could not understand what i'm talking about from this graph let's say you had this kind of phone in 1984 where you have can only speak from one side and somebody can listen and now if you see in 2020 you have this kind of phone where you can even see somebody's who is the other side what is texting you know like all the things you know best technology on your hand right so this is journey from this 1984 to 2020 it's happened because of impact of technological advancement so i am talking about this same thing for gas sensor there is a technological advance hap is happening and from 2015 to 2020 and that's how well system what we get or what we want to get you know 
now so let's now we will dig a uh, little bit uh, this one slide i put it for the market split because in the first slide i said that indigenously developed right so why there is a requirement of developing the system in india when it is already available outside so we need to understand right that when we buy something that import export thing happens right this is, the system goes very very costly and especially in case of gas sensor system it needs calibration i mean calibration is this needs kind of a reset when you use that anything and you want to reset that so for resetting any particular system you need to send it outside so that will add the cost of uh, of that resetting that part in 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 broad uh, uh, language or uh, broad word i can say so you don't, we, you really don't want to send the things outside for the recalibration or reset and then get back and then start using it right it loses your time it loses your energy and the money lot of other things so we wanted to make the things here so that and even the calibration facility also so that when we develop a system we can calibrate here and then deploy it back again so if you look at the market split till now is kind of you have a gas sensor companies you know who are fabricating only gas sensor chip there are some companies who are making the gas sensor system system is they are plugging the sensor to the electronics and giving very good interface to the user and kind of selling that in the in the indian market i would say uh, in abroad as well right so what these system companies they do they take the sensors from these uh gas sensor companies and plug to here they buy that kind of or they own the technology or they tell that okay, you have to you know kind of send us the sensor and then they plug it and sell it so what happens they so these system company they don't have much control over the gas sensor chip performance whatever they are able to do it they try to do and send it to there and they just plug it ready made thing is like off the shelf they just take and plug it so uh, user if he doesn't get more functionality in it it's, it's limited to that when the two parties are working in this in this field right so that is one thing uh, we realize that you know that is one thing we missing and uh, the the import export thing is there the calibration part was the thing which was uh, uh, adding a lot of cost so in that uh, we started making our own thing so it's this says that meet the challenges whatever i said till now is all the challenges for us because we were going to do this from the scratch and then we say it kind of made in india or made in india so there a lot of challenges were there is like these are things size cost cost reduction multiple gas detection increased sensitivity low powers and have good sensor like these are kind of parameter like these kind of feature you want from the gas sensor device okay so we made a wafer scale process this is a 4 inch uh, silicon uh, wafer where you can see these small small tiny devices the size of 1 mm by 1 mm 1000 micron by 1000 micron and this is one gas sensor chip which uh, utilizes around 30 milliwatt of power so this uh, we could reach uh, 30 milliwatt of power because of rigorous chip design what we have done so there is one guy thanks to rohit suman he was working when i joined this group and uh, he came up with very nice idea here if you see that the heater design it has very you know a thin wire outside and thick inside you know somebody who are interested want to you know understand why this happening you can read these papers or you can even google search that simple uh, resistivity thing sarge can do l by a and all you can and you can see the how the heat will generate and you can see the heat profile across this so we don't want heat profile should be high here and low here and high here so not heat profile should not be like this heat profile should be flat so that when we put uh, so this is the one micro heater which we use uh, to activate this gas sensing material which i said uh, metal oxide uh, semiconductor so when you use this micro heater and activate this sensing material and when any resistance change happens these are the two electrodes which record the change of that resistance due to gas and you understand the signals and then signals signals are recorded and processed further so so you can understand how deep down we need to tune our our kind of make the chip design so that we can bring out the beauty of from this chip right so there are many things happen here so the details are there in the papers and you can google search that why we do that way. 
to understand the basic physics. Right. So how we fabricated uh, this gas sensor uh, chip? Uh, we just see it quickly is we take the silicon. This is silicon here. Okay. And then we passive it with the PCV dioxides. Here I have listed the process and kind of tool. And then you pattern this microheater. It's a, a TIPT microheater that we pattern on top of uh, this uh, passivated silicon. Then we passivate this uh, uh, microheater here with SiO2. Then we do RI. Basically, there's the pads we need to open for the electrical connections. And then we put the sensing electrodes, which basically measure the uh, resistance of the sensing layer, which is sitting here, right? So, and so this is the particular uh, uh, fabrication process. What we do, okay? Just to make it low power, we need to do uh, some backside etching, right here. This, so we try to create a air. This, this is the air here, right? Earlier it was uh, silicon, now it's air. So now you can compare the thermal conductivity of a silicon and thermal conductivity of air and trying to understand, you know, why we are doing this. The details are there in this uh, uh, paper. paper. So that when we try to, uh, you know, dig this silicon out, you have very low power gas sensor chip because what happens when you heat this heater, the thermal mass, basically the heat is not going to lose through the silicon. Now it's the air and air is a bad conductor, right? You understand from the beginning, right? It's a bad, bad conductor. So you save a lot of power, by the way, here to achieve that particular temperature. And that's the reason that uh, we, we etch this uh, silicon and this is the air gap, you can see. And we came up with this uh, sensor chip. Now to utilize this chip, basically, uh, we need to assemble in some certain fashion and we need to make one system so that uh, we can deploy our user can use it without any difficulty so what goes into this system is we first uh, kind of package this chip on this uh, platform okay and then this uh, particular uh, package sensor chip goes into the electronic interface as i said in the beginning and this is your complete system that's how you make that uh, uh, gas sensor system so it's, 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 it's very challenging, right? So when you start making this, you need to have a control at this region because this performance of this system is highly dependent on this. Okay, what all the parameter, how good uh, performance you do from, uh, uh, try to get from this chip and what kind of power, what kind of performance for gas detection, different parameters, like as I said, sense, sensitivity, how fast it can detect the gas. So this all should, uh, we should control at this point, so that you can bring down the, uh, you can bring up the beauty of uh, this this uh, system what we developed. That's called the gas sensor uh, system. Okay, and so when we open this uh, this let's let's open this part, and when you open this, you can see that we have packaged the chip over here. This is the platform, and there's a uh, uh, thanks to the packaging team is sitting at uh, Sense at third floor. So, and we have system lab packaging and gas sensor that I will say in the last, uh, we'll talk about in the last. So, they, they help us to package those chips and do the wire bonding process. And we utilized some uh, uh, of the self uh, sensors to understand the humidity and temperature of the surrounding. And th this is how we get the all sensor packaged, right? So, now once the your chip is ready, it is packaged. Now it's time to calibrate the gas sensor uh, chip, right? So we use this uh, calibration setup. It's a basically mass flow control setup we have. So where you can put your synthetic air or nitrogen and you have a test gas, could be CO, CO2, NO2, SO2, as any gas, right? And then you mix it in a particular uh, chamber where so that you can have a good control, a good mixing between synthetic and test gas. And this gas comes out and came, uh, basically comes in the surrounding of this chip. And this chip is temperature control uh, chip. Basically, we control the temperature of this metal oxide layer by, by providing some uh, uh, voltage to this. You know, you can heat it, you can apply different, different voltage, you can get the different, different temperature. And we also record uh, this uh, resistance of this uh, sensing material, that is R, at fixed voltage. So when there's any change of the concentration, this PPM happens on the surface of this, you can see the change in the resistance. Like you can say that delta R versus R, R, R air versus R gas, how much change is there. And that from there, you calculate a lot of things like uh, sensitivity, you know, and also it can be used for the selectivity as well. When you record the resistance for different gas concentration, 
you can get the selectivity and response time recovery time. So this is a calibration setup what we have. So when we did the calibration setup, we realized that uh, when we are doing with the 0% RH, right, that's how you get the cylinder from the market. You don't get the mixed humidity right now. Okay, and uh, you, even if you get it, you get a very fixed humidity. Uh, so what we realized that the sensor signal was going down. I mean, the baseline was going down. So these are the dry gases. When you expose on the sensor, what happens, your, your room has uh, around 60, 65 uh, uh, relative humidity when you are putting the dry gas on the sensor surface it first take out all the water molecules from the surface and along with the gas detection so this there is a competitive reaction right there's a removal of uh, air molecules from the surface and the gas detection both are happening because of that you see this kind of beer trend it should not happen right so and when you put a uh, wet gas like 75 percent rh and you see that the 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 baseline is going up that, that's also not you know advisable it should be kind of flat as much as you can make okay so that was an issue uh, generally you get if you do in the lab you will face this kind of problem okay so how to tackle this problem so we need to develop uh, the humidity uh, filter for it so that was the one thing we need to do it to you know uh, kind of remove these all kind of uh, weird things from the uh, sensor signal so we took the filter assembly, we, we did a lot of discussion and thought to have a, a filter in proximity of a sensor. The reason behind it, because if anything happens to the filter, we can remove it or we can replace it so that we can save the cost of the chip here, right? In case of when you put the filter on top of the chip, if anything happens to the filter or die, you know, you need to discard the entire setup. So that will add a lot of cost. Okay, so you can understand why we chose this uh, filter in proximity. Proximity means there's a certain amount of gap is there, air gap, right? So gas has to come from this side to the filter and then it will, so there will be no condition in the environment where you have a dry, dry atmosphere. You will have a dryness of like minimum of 20% RH, relative humidity 40 at least. So this filter will work to control the RH inside this, uh, uh, are in proximity of the sensor chip, I would say. Okay, and, that's, and that will bring the, the, the control in a, in a sensor signal. Okay, we'll see that, how, how, how it is happening. Okay, so uh, earlier we used to do this kind of industrial packaging, you know, we kind of some, some this outer case we used to buy and get it. So I, I just say the industrial packaging, what we used to do. Now we need to put the filter. So it's kind of a customization we, I have to do, right? So when, so just do the customization, what we rely that somebody will not do, somebody will not change your entire, just entire thing of packaging or entire routine of packaging just because of your requirement, right? So it's good to have your own things in your lab. So this is all things is done in that uh, packaging lab and system lab. There we came up with the PCB where you can mount the single sensor, you can mount the four sensors all together. And I will I, I will just explain why we used why we did that. And this kind of packaging, this is the 3D simple packaging what we have. So you can do the customization. I mean, you can put your own filter in between and the way you want, right? So so that's what like I mean, you get a control over the sensor. When you buy from outside, you don't really get that control. If something's happening, it is happening actually. Okay, so this this uh, and also it 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 it, uh, it will bring down the cost because when you are doing it in the lab and because initially you want to understand how good is your chip, right? You don't want to make very beautiful system. It should look very good from outside, but actually in performance is bad. You first want the performance to be good, and then we can talk about how good it should look when you sell to the customer. Okay, so. Uh, if you see this, uh, you know, this is the graph where you have a temperature and relative humidity and number of days here. So if you see day night, right, when sun comes out and, and sun, sunset, you see uh, we recorded day one to day nine, uh, the humidity and temperature profile of the environment. We can see this red curve, like, you know, you reach very high humidity, like 70 uh, percent and uh, 60, 65, 70 uh, percent. And the temperature will be low here, you know. Uh, in, in, when the humidity is very high, you can see this uh, uh, temperature is coming down to very low, right? So that's how it, it works, okay? So when we put it, the, this only geolite that is fresh in the atmosphere and we recorded the value. So what we see that, the, 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 the kind of frequency, the change was happening in this region. Now it has come down to this region, you know? 
so why because of this this filter what we have here it is kind of absorbing the moisture because zeolite is like you call it uh, boiling stone actually okay so it's zeolite which absorbs a lot of moisture and only passes little bit amount okay uh, so there's certain issue with the only zeolite part but you can see here that the, the change was uh, reduced down and it is positive signals right so when you have this zeolite in the atmosphere it, so this will definitely bring some good uh, uh, controlled change in your sensor signal sorry so uh, we have uh, so we did the filter assembly so what we did is to uh, uh, minimize this uh, change this change further we uh, inserted one wire that is the nickel chromium wire so we heat it at certain temperature so what happens any amount of moisture is going in basically is kind of a reflecting back from here and certain amount of moisture is only reaching to the this uh, uh, sensor part and we plug some humid humidity and temperature sensor over here just to understand how much moisture is going inside okay so this is kind of design we make it and uh, when we got the data this is without zeolite this is only zeolite and this is heated zeolite where you have zeolite plus heating wire inside it so you can see that you know from here to there what kind of uh, control we got in the moisture you know now it's looking so flat right okay uh, forget uh, don't worry about a lot of power we are consuming over here but just to understand this to control the certain parameter you know we we customize this packaging and we really got that okay so that that should be the intention to when you see some something happening in the lab just try to think about and see whether we can really get that control and how how stable how good is that it just uh, just just for some time or it's really for it, it's, it's kind of solution you got for a lifetime right okay so yeah so this was the final part we did and so now we plug this our filter that is heated filter in the sensor and and we compare the data so here we have no filter data i mean there is no filter only the sensor is there and we expose that sensor so we recorded the humidity and when we see that humidity up and down here many days data is there okay so we see that the baseline is like keep fluctuating up and down lot of okay initially it was okay fine and then we you know kind of expose 3.1 ppm no2 and see how much change is coming it's like 100 nano ampere change is coming into the signal that's an indication for 3.1 ppm no2 presence in that air okay now when we put the heated filter here you can see that change you know first you see the change here your humidity and temperatures came into the certain window and it is fluctuating in that okay that's that's the beauty of heated zeolite filter and also you can see this 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 baseline which is quite controlled not that great i would say but compared to the previous without filter you have much more controlled and you can see for the same percentage or same ppm no2 you have much much higher uh, change in the uh, current or resistance i would say okay so this is what you are looking for you know you don't want a lot of noise in the background you want the more uh, signal to noise ratio uh, by the way so this is what we are getting and we when we compared it you know so when you don't have uh, zeolite or heated you have 85% whatever is there in the moisture it is coming to on the sensor when when you have a kind of filter in between the only the 45% is coming so whether so in the in the uh, room or in the environment it will vary like you know 40 to uh, let's say to 85 in the rainy season it may go to 95% rh so we got this kind of uh, so you can see the more detail in this uh, uh, one article and see, see that what all the details are there minute minute details are there okay how we made it how we fix that so this is the beauty of this uh, heated zeolite filter and that's what we achieved okay so uh, now to to uh, so when we recorded this uh, data it will we put it this all uh, things outside and we recorded it now if you want to have different humidity let's say so uh, we need to have one setup like calibration setup you know we i just talked about the dry one calibration setup in the, in the few slides back now it's a modified one where we have our own humidity control which can control the humidity the whatever way we want to to the test system so earlier setup was was this this part now we added this part 
and we can control there a lot of sensors gross humidity uh, control sensor there and we can really control the amount of moisture we want during the calibration we can do 40 45 50 like that okay and the temperature as well so it's a modified calibration setup that we made it in the lab okay so this is all the background we talked about the gas sensor chip fabrication and what kind of signal and how we control the signal and what kind of uh, modification we did in a packaging and why we did in a packaging and what kind of parameter we want to control so uh, this is all the background now we will uh, talk about the developed gas sensor prototypes or systems and the field deployment part okay so some more uh, more calibration tools that we use it is this is the one standard setup calibration setup and and one more thing i want to highlight here you know if you do one chip calibration are testing at a time you are losing the time you are losing the amount of gas basically it's costing more so you must have multi-channel uh, sensor calibration system in the lab where you can you know kind of plug many devices all together anyway your gas is flowing in the certain volume right in the certain chamber you plug most of the sensor and you record each and every uh, uh, sensor data right so we got this multi-channel sensor calibration system to reduce the cost of calibration and some different uh, humidity chamber if you want to really control in a lab and boc setup you want to do the like different bocs like formality formality acetone or different gases so this is the setup we have okay so the highlight part is uh, we we got uh, uh, finally we developed this uh, sen uh, this sensor you know that is in the, uh, we got uh, package done this out casing from outside then we did customized part because we wanted to plug in our filter in between here okay in this way we developed these four prototypes one is air quality this is uh, uh, for s 2 s restriction this is for NO2 and this is for uh, separate CO2 for indoor application okay. So I'll, I'll be talking about these three uh, setup here. So this is air quality monitoring uh, setup. So we did lab calibration. We got uh, this this table. You can even get you know this kind of data from any by the sensor from outside. What kind of layer you are using for particular gas? You know what range of uh, uh, concentration you are doing? Resolution, accuracy. You know a lot of response time. Other parameters are like what would be the life and how it is going to work. You know this is the standard thing we get it. So once you do this, you really uh, then go for a field deployment. So what we thought if we you know deploy these uh, system uh, very close to a gold standard setup. Gold standard mean is the very low chance of uh, uh, you know. Uh, uh, some uh, uh, false false data or outliers you can say that in some way so we have uh, around 12 stations in a bangalore and each of the station cost is 1.5 around that okay so first of all, the cost reduction you know this, this is very low cost we developed it so what we did we plugged our two units okay you can see the two units we plugged it very close to this standard setup Okay, this KSPCB is uh, Karnataka State Pollution Control Board, right? Okay, so and uh, this is giving some uh, values because here the detection principle for this KSPCB system is is optical, some are optical, some are chemical illumination. This is like great one, okay, uh, best one I would say. And when you plug our sensor with based on the metal oxides based, you understand there could be little bit, uh, you know. Uh, 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 problem in the detection range you may not able to cover entire but really you want to compare how well how much offset you are there when you start comparing your setup and standard setup and if there is a room for uh, uh, for a development further you can understand from when you compare both the data right so these the units are running from almost eight months, uh, I think seven to eight months, and we are collecting a data. So one of the data actually uh, we are working with Professor Bharadwaj and uh, their team who comes from uh, uh, data science background and they use uh, deep learning, machine learning tools, and they, so in the machine learning and deep learning, you know, you have uh, uh, training set data and then you have test uh, set data. You try to you develop a model from the training data and see how good model is this and then you implement on a further uh, 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 test data and you see so here you can uh, come see that you have KSPCB values for NO2 sensor and you can see our model output what we make from our own data 
and we fitted our, our own data, first is the best fit we got. So you can see it's kind of closely matching it. But there is an issue is we are not able to capture these tiny, tiny higher peaks, right? So that's why I said that you have a scope for the development somewhere. Somewhere you are missing, but overall pattern you are following. Right. That's that's a positive kind of uh, output you have that will in encourage you definitely, and then you will really dig down and see that. So our whole journey is now going on, and we are trying to understand how we can get the best fit and uh, the best data, and so that we can, you know, once the model is fixed, you can put it uh, on on each and every system what we develop. And that, that's how you, you, you do it, okay? So you must have a control from the fabrication to the packaging part, robust packaging you must have, and then when you deploy in a field, you know, uh, then you start comparing a data and how good is your model output that you should have, right? Okay, so now we will talk about little bit about the leak monitoring. So this is uh, we doubled because we get some of the uh, some of the requirement from the uh, Siri Haricota that's a launching pad where they launch and they utilize uh, they use different fuels like N2H4 and O2. So they gave a task to us to develop different sensors like O2, NO2, H2, and N2H4, and these are the four systems. So currently these systems are getting calibrated in a field okay it's lab calibration is kind of going on in parallel with the field calibration okay so uh, yeah so in this this setup is uh, is here if you see the system is is kind of user friendly you know whenever any problem with this sensor you can plug out and plug in the new sensor it's like this kind of user friendly uh, you know they wanted us to develop and we finally develop this kind of thing you, you can plug any sensor here you want to so that's how we develop hydrogen no2 o, uh, o2 and n2h4 and I, I must highlight this n2h4 part this is the first time uh you know uh, we uh, all over the world i would say if i try to compare that is we develop n2h4 sensor system there are many research paper you will get and you know but this complete sensor system based on the metal oxides because here we use some metal oxide that get etched with n2h4 okay it's try to kind of uh, dig that material kind of eat that material okay so how we well we control that in that and so this all we control from uh, the chip level that operating conditions, what kind of operating condition we should use so that you should not have uh, uh, very uh, uh, less life of the sensor and it can go for higher and higher. And there are a lot of challenges still we are trying to uh, solve. Okay. Now, uh, let's change the gear and come to the breath analysis part. So our whole idea on breath analysis is uh, Kind of, uh, you know, when you exhale out certain amount of gases and detect it with the system, it's called non-invasive techniques. You know, if you take your blood sample or anything, you try to puncture your body and try to understand what kind of disease you have. So that's invasive method. Your non-invasive method is like just to collect your breath sample and analyze it and okay. So why I'm saying this is, so our idea was like this, you know, so if you see in our breath, you have different BOCs, BSCs, volatile compound, volatile self compound, you can Google search it, you will get many and many, what comes out from your breath and if you can plug your sensor here and detect that so that you know you understand what kind of concentration is there and why i'm seeing this i will i'll just i'll tell you after to to uh, P, uh, to uh, ppt here okay so if you can detect these gases you can talk about the what kind of disease you have okay so why i'm saying it is uh, because if you see our uh, respiratory system is it works like that you know you you uh, inhale oxygen you inhale different gases of course but majorly i'm talking about this oxygen part that's a requirement for it and you if you go from this one two three or four five to six system basically these gases do exchange uh, with your uh, blood vessels or cell you can say uh, you know at this point and release certain amount of gases back to this and those gases you know comes out here and you those actually gases are there so certain gases i have listed you can see that so you basically exhale out many gases some are uh, you exhale out h2s and that S2S is for halotis. Halotis is nothing but it's a bad breath. You know, some people have this very uh, bad breath, right? It's because of S2S level, right? You see what happens when you get it when you are sleeping, I mean, sleep entire night and the morning when you get up, you know, you see this kind of, you know, unpleasant smell, I would say. That's because of S2S. 
and uh, uh, acetone that is a biomarker marker for diabetes you have formaldehyde that's a biomarker for breast cancer you know and uh, this uh, um, uh, ammonia you have for diabetes so these are four thing uh, i just summarized it uh, because we just wanted to go one by one okay so and so here you can see for unhealthy human you have this level okay for healthy human you have this level it means if your sensor is giving the signal, first you calibrate it in that range and you try to understand the sample. And if it is uh, indicating in this range, it means you have healthy body. I mean, healthy uh, man is that. And uh, now if it is giving, let's say, more than this, then there is an indicator that you may have this kind of uh, disease, I would say. Okay. So this, this, this is kind of quality indication you know it's, it's not so much quantitative because that is a broad range here you know 250 to all the way to ppe okay but it is it's, it's a good indication at the early stage okay especially for diabetes you know breast cancer in early diabetes okay like that you have a concentration for all healthy and unhealthy just when you calibrate you choose uh, these ranges for the calibration of these sensors okay now, so little more uh, about breath analysis. If you understand this breath, you know, you have uh, uh, axial uh, breath vapor and you have axial breath condensate. In that, you have some BOCs, non BOCs, and these are the major gases, uh, you know, it comes out CO2, O2, and 2. In that, you have to detect that those gases which I just listed uh, in the last PPT. So, there is an endogenous compound, here is an exogenous compound. You can Google it and read about it. It's like if there is a gas coming out with the exchange with the uh, blood stream here, then it's like uh, endogenous, right? When it is, you are inhaling the... Dr. Prajapati. Sorry? Dr. Prajapati, I just want to remind you that it is now 7 or 2. Okay. Uh, I just want to know how many more slides think, you have. Uh, it's going well. Almost uh, done. I mean, four, four slides. Almost done. Excellent. Okay, five, five, there are also questions coming up, so I just wanted to alert you. Okay. Thank you very much. You. It's going well. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Fine. So, uh, okay. Like, I mean, you can just Google that, so it's not that. But just to highlight that, you have this uh, breath sample. You can take it for 10 seconds and try to understand what amount of and when we should collect the sample in the Tadler bag for the analysis. Okay. Now, so in this way, you develop this halitosis uh, system for the Unilever company and you have this kind of profile air sample goes to the sensor, analyze it and give the feedback whether you have low level, medium and high level of uh, STS. So uh, come to the ventilator part, right? In the ventilator, you so when the person is not able to inhale or exhale himself or herself, you need a ventilator kind of a device which will force the gas to your lung kind of oxygen and then it will try to uh, keep you alive that's a situation that happening now you know you may heard about why we need ventilator you can google it and see that why we need ventilator in this kind of pandemic you know and so the, you control a lot of parameters like tidal volume respiratory rate oxygen level and respiratory flow pattern uh, you know uh, so in the ventilator you have different sensors like flow sensors air pressure temperature humidity and gas sensors so we majorly you know we started working this on gas sensor part majorly on uh, oxygen gas sensors and uh, so we have primarily results over here and you can see that we developed this uh, uh, oxygen sensor and we try to detect these levels from 28 to all the way to 96 percent and this kind of output we are getting we are still working on this so these are this is the very primary results okay so this is whole journey i covered from the fabrication to packaging and all the challenges i i think try to answer that most of the thing in that that practical things as a researcher as a student what you encounter in the lab and just try to dig down and see if you can solve it without the help of the professor right because most of the professor don't have time to dig that okay just kidding it okay fine so i mean so uh, you have uh, so this whole journey start is, you know, it's like you are flying the plane of the sensor journey. So you have the sense crew at the team and we have gas sensor team, uh, system lab team, packaging lab team. And yes, the crew is incomplete without the pilot. So we have two pilot, Professor Nawakan, but and Professor Nayak, so they really guide us and they give a lot of time. <laughs> actually okay so in this is my last thank you all and organization Revti and sunil to pick down all the glitches what we had yesterday and i hope uh, you know i made a lot of things very clear to the audience okay so thank you so much it's up to you now yeah thank you
yeah uh, thank you very much uh, dr prajapati for a wonderful talk on uh, gas sensors uh, there are some of the questions uh, uh, so the first question from professor uh, rama venkateshwaran is calibration required for all kinds of gas sensors uh, he he means uh, the sensor deployment in hazardous place and remote places where mm -hmm. the sensor calibration is challenging so mm -hmm. So, do you what do you suggest? Okay. So, uh, you really yes, uh, you need to. Uh, I mean, so so if you have good control from your uh, sensor chip part and and also the operating condition of this chip. I mean, for different gas sensor chip and so you really calibrate initially and try to see that what is the calibration life how frequent it needs the calibration. If it needs, let's say, within, uh, every month, then it's a lot of tedious job, right, to go into the field and do. And if you can remotely do the calibration, kind of baseline reset, kind of some glitches, you know, are coming that. So that is really a challenge and it's open, open to all that. If the sensor uh, uh, calibration period is very small, like three months, four months, then yes, you need to have, uh, some portable, uh, you know, instrument or uh, kind of uh, arrangement so that you can go to the location and do the calibration. So because that's important. So if you want to get very accurate result, you must, you know, calibrate uh, as per the data sheet provided. Okay. That's an open challenge, right? So initially, right now, what we do that we take the device all the back to the lab and calibrate and deploy it. So, of course, this is the uh, tedious job, right? So, if you want to minimize that labor work, yes. Either you, uh, some of the glitches, you can do that with the uh, remotely, and but actual default and actual failure of the chip and system, you need to, you know, see physically. And of course, the calibration you have to do in the lab right now, we don't have portable calibration setup. Yes, we are thinking in that, that if we can get, let's say, uh, for example, CO2 like 400 ppm uh, cylinder, we go into the field and just expose the 400 ppm and see if that change is the same as the uh, three months back or four months back in the lab. Yes, then we can calibrate physically over there, try to set a little bit offset uh, in the field, right? Yes, this is the answer uh, from my side. Yeah. Uh, the next question is, uh, how is the selectivity ensured by the sensing film? Yeah, so I have not shown a lot of selectivity graph actually, just because I wanted to cover that entire thing stuff so that you understand what I'm talking. Uh, but selectivity, yes, of course we do that. And uh, let's say if you talk about the hydrogen, so selectivity we achieve first from the sensing layer itself. We control or we optimize this sensing layer thickness, that grain size, grain boundary, if you go to little deep into it, once that is clear, then we do the uh, sensing film layer testing and get the more selective. Then we jump on the device and then we see the selectivity there. If, uh, you know, there is an issue, we try to, you know, control uh, by using these parameters like uh, temperature and uh, the sensor voltage, what you have. Okay? That kind of fine tune with this and this is what we get, right? These all sensors are selective to that. and. Then you can do some of the modeling where you can remove these kind of you know outliers, kind of fluctuation, all this stuff to make your sensor more selective. Yes, this is the answer for that question. Uh, which type of microheaters are used for the moisture removing, and uh, uh, can this uh, be used in the vacuum as well under vacuum conditions? Uh, the, which type of? I mean, this. Uh, so this is the nickel chromium heater. Okay, if you apply certain voltage, it heats, it's just like a heating coil and we are not using any vacuum to uh, remove it because in, in a real application, uh, if just trying to understand the question, if you're talking about the geolite part, right, because geolite gets saturated so fast, you know, so if to avoid the saturation, we put it this uh, nickel chromium wire so that if you heat it at certain temperature, that is 60 degree, uh, 50 degree, so that it it try, it try to balance the adsorption of the moisture and it remove the uh, 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 moisture from the uh, uh, geolite. So it's kind of balancing it out. That's why you have very controlled moisture inside your uh, uh, sensor. So the, it means if you have controlled moisture, whatever the change in the concentration happening, you can see the change in the signal. Okay, so there is no vacuum. I mean, uh, we, we wanted to have a solution which can work in a field. So uh, if I understand the question right, uh, this is my answer. Uh, 
uh, in extension to that question only how is the humidity is maintained constantly inside the chamber uh, how it is maintained so just i explained that initially you know you have zeolite okay when you keep exposing the 95% it will saturate definitely it will saturate but zeolite has little bit self removing power but that self let's say self removing i mean to say if you expose 95% and you leave it for certain amount of time in the air it will come down to let's say 70% that's a that's a real experience what I, I i really personally saw that because i really tested it and i really worked on okay so, and uh, then it will be 65 it will not go low okay so what what we did we plugged this nickel chromium as i said in the previous question so what is happening the adsorption like if you are flowing 95% uh, moisture inside through this fuel uh, uh, zeolite it is kind of removing certain amount and maintaining that 45% okay ah now you can say that it it will you know when you heat it it can uh, you know remove both side because it's, it's it's up and down right okay so that that's that's the beauty we got it where you have how to control the zeolite thickness and how thin wire you do it and what is the temperature you know the 50 degree 50 60 degree is your optimized one initially we were working at 190 that is removing the complete moisture but you know so but you know what is happening it, it is getting burned out so let me tell you i think the question is coming at that point when you have zeolite and heat that the, the, the zeolite initially you will within a 5 minutes you will see very high humidity okay because it is removing that moisture both side so inside you will see very high after some time it will slowly you know get saturated at 45% that that's that's a practical uh, you know observation we have yes Uh, is the process of fabrication liga or sol gel no it's uh, it's, it's, it's okay so it's uh, uh, it's a basically physical deposition technique you have chemical before chemical uh, deposition technique you have physical deposition technique it's physical one because we wanted to do the mass product, mass fabrication if you look if you see uh, see the few slides in the beginning you have one silicon wafer there is around 3000 devices you have you cannot do the sol gel or silar or you know some method you cannot just put the material on top of because the chip is very tiny it is 1000 micron yeah like i mean 1 mm by 1 mm and the area the sensing area is 250 micron by 250 micron okay so so what we did we opened uh, the that particular region by using the photo uh, photolithography and then we physically deposit i mean we used sputtering technique rf sputtering technique for the metal oxides okay and for the metal dc okay so yes. it is a physical deposition yes that's the answer yeah yeah uh, one more question from dr vikram are you planning any sensor for covid 19 even i too had a question <laughs> Okay. Uh, before, okay. I mean, okay. There's a lot of news are floating around. Okay, you can see that government even also we started planning after this pandemic, right? To buying the ventilator, this, that, that. So even all most of the researcher is started doing. Okay, we we will make. 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 Uh, you know people started making the ventilator, this, that. A lot of news are floating around. You can you know see that. Yes. with that uh, when we had this we so during this lockdown uh, you know we thought what to do that you know so i was more, more accessible to the lab so why so we thought why don't we fine tune our oxygen sensor that we have developed for the isro requirement isro requirement was to tell whether the oxygen level is high like more than 20% or 15% like depletion mode and increment mode but in a ventilator you have requirement from all the 20 to all the way to 100 so we use the same chip we fine tune the operating conditions and we thought this can be utilized in a ventilator we are half way done okay so it's not completed done we are half way done we are still working on a filter part there because what kind of pressure they use in that to fill that chamber in a, i did not go through the detail of the ventilator what kind of chamber they use they fill uh, the you know there is amount uh, like 2 to 3 bar pressure should be there so we should have a filter which will reduce the pressure as well okay otherwise your wire bonding or your chip towards a released chip in a air it may damage you know so a lot of challenges are the practical challenges are there okay so we are working in that direction yes one more question from dr banu prashant the biggest challenge in gas sensing is selectivity 
Yeah. Since any measurement will always have the mixture of gases in varying proportions, right. I request you to know how exactly it is achieved. Right. So uh, we have uh, one. So yeah, that, that, that's a very fine question. Is because uh, if you see a lot of literature, you people do the selectivity measurements by one by one. They put NO2, they put uh, SO2, or one by one, and they detect that. And in, for one of the gases, the de desired gases, if you can get the high signal, okay, they say that it's selective. We have done this when we were doing at the film level, but actual the chip level, what we did, we have a setup where we can uh, flow uh, all four or five gases together. Right now, we can flow four gases together. Okay, let's say you flow CO, that's a 1 ppm, then on that 1 ppm change of the sensor signal, we flow other CO2, NO2 and SO2 and try to understand how much signal change is happening because of these interfering gases on the CO signal. Okay, and then, then when we calculate the delta L, delta R and see that if, if at that basic uh, uh, signal level, how much selectivity we can get and then the same data we then uh, feed it into the model and then we try to understand what kind of algorithm we have to because for some of the gases you can understand like for some of the gases the change will be uh, i mean the, there will be increase in the resistance for some of the gases they will decrease in the resistance if you are making the sensor which is always showing positive r then the, if the, any gas, if let's say you tested four gases and some, three gases are showing lower in the resistance, I mean resistance is decreasing, then of course you can make the algorithm very clearly that if there is a uh, positive slope, then it is detecting that the gas which we wanted to detect, right? So this is a little, you know, uh, many uh, kind of uh, common sense with data and algorithm goes all together to make this sensor select. That's why we, we could achieve that. Yes. Uh, there are uh, a couple of questions uh, specifically from Ramachandra sir. Yeah. Uh, I will read out one by one. Sometimes high temperature of the oxide layer will take more time to stabilize. Yes. So in the, the following points are not clear. The first one is saturation after a certain duration. Mm. The next is do we need a fan to direct and force the gas through the filter and direct the flow in certain direction? Okay, so let me answer this. Is uh, yeah. yes, uh, this, the fan yeah. part? What you what he is asking is so right now it is a diffusion based detection. I mean, diffusion based means is the gas ha if leakage somewhere it has to diffuse through the air and reach to the sensor. Until unless it will not reach to the sensor, it won't detect. Okay, now that the few of the systems uh, are, are there where you they have a fan which will try to you know pull that kind of you know even KSPCV has that fan that has capacity of pulling the air 21 liter per minute if I'm correct 20 21. So they were forcefully pulling that. So in case of leak detection we have not implemented but in case of air quality monitoring we are in a phase of implementing that fan. But there are a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, optimization is going there. And it's not very straightforward to, you know, just change the fan because you have to have whether your sensor is flow dependent or not and whether it is doing some kind of cooling to the, your microheater or not. Even though it is very tiny, but you have to see that. what is uh, how what is the flow rate you should keep. I mean, the sucking rate you should keep and, and how you should make sure the ventilation is happening. OK, and, and first you do the calibration on, on those conditions in that condition and then you deploy it. So that phase is uh, going on. Yes. Uh, any other question actually? Yeah. yeah. Are these sensors uh, in extension to that only? Yeah. Are I mean, some it... question related to the saturation part. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. is that, uh, you see, uh, rough, our operating temperature is uh, minimum of 250, max of 400. That is for hydrogen, we have 400 actually. You can then argue where with 400, it can catch the fire. No, because it is very tiny, the very tiny, small, because heater 200 micro by 200 is very tiny heat, it won't catch the fire. And it is sitting with a lot of filters, so yes, it will not. And so the, the, the question about this uh, saturation part, I mean, how long you have to wait. So each and every sensor, uh, uh, what you choose from different metal oxides had different saturation time. I mean, uh, after some, so th that term is called the warm up time. So either you have to, so for uh, S2S sensor, what we have done for the Uni River, it takes 45 minutes to one hour. 
okay so you plug your unit i mean you start your unit and then measure it after uh, one hour so these all the systems some are battery operated some uses the power from the pole okay so they will be always on we are not making the duty cycle mode to make the power consumption and all right now we are collecting the real time data so once it is saturated it is fine it is running so we want to understand how how good is that so i think this is the answer from my side sunil yeah uh, zeolite might saturate and not observe water anymore yeah. uh, can this be carried on drones and measure explosives at speeds of 25 meters per second Mm, I did not understand the question. After it can saturate and then what? And not observe water anymore. So, so to uh, uh, I mean uh, to remove that, uh, to avoid that condition of saturation, we plug this uh, uh, heater. I mean the coil into it because we uh, first uh, uh, basically uh, observe the saturation. So there was no further kind of gas was going because once it is filled with the water molecule, there will be no further you know gas diffusion or you need very high force to diffuse that you know so and also it will drop it to on the the water molecule will drop on the sensor chip and it will damage it. So that was the failure we had. That's why to avoid that situation, we put it the heating coil, which is not uh, making the zeolite uh, saturated. Uh, that's that's the reply actually. Uh, anything yeah. there? Uh, can this be carried on drones and measure explosives at speeds of 25 meters per second? Uh, the I same. Don't know actually. I don't know the answer. Exactly. Yeah, fine. Yeah. Uh, sorry, can sorry. metal nanoparticles be used in gas sensors? Yes, of course. Uh, I mean, uh, can be used, right? You see, it's all about you know how good you know the grain. You understand from the basic physics like grain, grain boundary, high angle grain boundary, low angle grain boundary. How uh, how much surface area, surface to volume ratio. If surface high volume is low, like very thin film, how good is that? So it's all made of different nano particles or different nano crystallites. You know, or if you dig down and see that it's everything is made of crystallites and nano particles, and then you you know assemble all together. You get a thin film right so of course yes why can't why don't we use that we use that and we are using it nanoparticles right only thing is whether you make it from the soldier method or solar method or different chemical method you get the nanoparticle you have to either kind of paste make the paste and uh, put it on the sensor and see how stable it is or you drop cast it and that's again is a research part right many papers are there you can read that and you can do our own things and try to understand the basic fundamental of gas sensors yes that's a reply. yeah yeah uh, VOC has a very low flash point. Uh, high temperature mm -hmm. operation sensors are not good. How to optimize room temperature working sensor? <laughs> Again, how to optimize room temperature? Yes. Uh, I did not, uh, uh, Sunil, cover the two uh, uh, major points here. Uh, major, I would say the major research points, two branches. One, I worked on micro to nano sensors uh, that is published somewhere. Okay, someone can have a look on my profile and he will get that uh, paper. There we try to miniaturize that entire thing and bring down the operating temperature at room temperature. Just for a detection of hydrogen right now, not for the VOCs, but same kind of principle or same kind of fabrication technique or way of fabrication can be used to get the low temperature operated device. So, and, and you have to do the fine tuning of your micro heater and you fine tuning of your uh, area where the gas is going to react. And yes, of course, that's a very fine question that for BOC is not recommended for high. So, I mean, roughly around, you know, if see, very fundamental, right? If you have any low temperature, let's say room temperature, something, you feel you will have definitely the inter large interference or big interference of this moisture variation. So somehow you can try to minimize the moisture uh, variation if you have this micro heater, which is you know sitting at very little more than 100 degree or 200 degree. You know, uh, this is a practical observation everyone knows and can understand. Right? A little bit high temperature, at least you will have a certain amount of moisture removal at the first stage itself. You don't have to do a lot of, uh, you know, here and there for the filter. Okay, so this is all, you know, put brain all together and make the sensors, either choose different techniques or you choose different way of making it and yeah, fine tune this design and make the low operating uh, temperature sensor. And then you have to, you know, see that how good it is, how well it is in terms of selectivity. Yes. Uh, what would be your suggestion for those students who lack access to fab? 
<laughs> <laughs> okay, so I mean, yeah. it's, 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 I mean, so you you can of course you can uh, you know contact us there, but we have the you know I mean you must be aware of Sunil and everything that we have uh, this IMP you know program is running there, and now is ISTEM, and even can assess the uh, you know different tools. Uh, uh, I think you can assess only the correctization tool through ISTEM, but through I IMP you can assess the fabrication. Part. So you have to just do one thing is like uh, there is a filter uh, filtration process in the selection is you have to write very good proposal and all the stuff and once that gets selected you get free access to all correctization and fabrication. I think that's only the way to do that if okay okay if you want to you know uh, uh, do the things from the scratch and you are you don't want to go somewhere and do the fabrication and do that I, I have very weird suggestion for you okay. Why don't you take a challenge, uh, you know, it is, it is to all even to me also, the, the same question to me also. Why don't you take challenge and make your own lithography system in India? Yes, of course, there's a lot of optics uh, involved in that, right? It will take 20 years or 25 years of, of your uh, time. You may not able to do, but at least you will complete 20 20% 20 of that. And then someone will take it forward and try to complete it. So this whole gas sensor journey is not done by me completely. There is many people are involved, as I said. Okay, so why don't you just take open challenge and put your whole effort to make the because we don't have lithography, we don't have DR, we only just you know get from outside everything done from Oxford or different one, right? And once you develop it, don't think that you know now you will be more insecure about job and all. Oh, I could not publish a paper, I will not get a job. This that see, you have to sacrifice something to do that. Okay, first you get a job and do this whole exercise. So my suggestion is that either you go if you want to publish a lot of paper and want to get the job quickly and want to stable your life. Go through the INP process, try to good professor uh, proposal and finish your part. Or you take a challenge and develop own uh, uh, system. What we use in Clego. Yes, this is the reply actually. Yeah. How can we fix the level of sensor current uh, for defined uh, percent level of oxygen? Uh, uh, different current with oxygen. Okay, I, I mean, the other way around, if I try to understand the question correctly, is uh, I'll take just one minute to reply if I understood correctly. Is you see, first, actually, we we see the base level. Let's say you have one micron current, which is coming at room temperature with certain amount of voltage, you are getting one micron. Then you put a oxygen. Let's say I put it to, uh, 28%. I get 1 to 2 micron. Then I put it 30%. I get 2 to 3 micron. Okay. So now I know for 8 mic 8 percent of oxygen change there is a change from 1 to 2 it means 1 micro ampere uh, is a delta when i put 30 percent I, when i go from 20 to 30 there is a 2 micro ampere delta i have this data set i have this lookup table okay i will use this lookup table in my microprocessor so that tomorrow if i uh, deploy this in the field if my sensor give me uh, uh, if my sensor sees uh, i mean 30 percent like 10 percent change in the oxygen it will so look up table in such a way that we feed that okay if you see this much amount of change in the current tell that there is a 30 percent oxygen that we feed it into the microphone and the once there is that kind of change happens in the sensor in a field you see on a screen that yes there is a 10 percent of increase of oxygen i think this is the reply from my side you first do the calibration and use that data to predict uh, your concentration in a different atmosphere yeah uh, how to choose the particular thickness of sensing layer in gas sensor Okay, this very general question, I would say, and uh, you know, uh, so okay, if for a beginner is, you know, what you do, you do first do the lot of literature survey. Even, you know, after completing my PhD, I, when I joined here in IIC, you know, the first ta task or you can say, you know, assignment I got to do the literature survey for the four months. Okay, and I did, after doing the PhD, I did the literature survey for four months and I under understood many fundamental stuff you know, how to choose, what to look for, which material is stable, you know, what kind of doping, I will tell very one observe, uh, kind of, you know, uh, experience what I achieved is, you know, you take any material, you know, you many, a lot of papers are there that they do a lot of dopings, this, that, and try to understand, you know, increase the conductivity, decrease the conductivity and make the senses, uh, you know, highly selective and sensitive and then they publish a the paper. I am telling you, every crystal has self-cleaning effect. You cannot dope any system 
just if you're doing at the room temperature, of course, there's a lot of things to debate here. If, so they try to remove all the dopings, what you try to do in a system using sol gel or whatever the method you have. Okay, don't so avoid doping, first of all. Just work on a particular raw material like take zinc oxide, take tungsten oxide, take vanadium, any uh, vanadium pentox, any material. Just take that raw, I mean, that without, uh, you know, pure material. Work on that. Try to understand how you can do the size control, nanoparticle control, crystallized size control, how you can do. Then once that is controlled, how do the thickness control? And even I have done it. If you know, if you see some of the paper, I have done the thicknesses from 10 nanometer to all the way to 500 nanometer. Then I tested each and every film for each and every different operating temperature for different concentration. You know, so there is was a like uh, you know a background study for two years. Then we could achieve a one particular thickness for one particular temperature for one particular gas. It is not an overnight thing we did it. We took it almost two to three years. And I can say that how can you, you can just go to my, my profile and you can understand the gap after PhD and the postdoc, that publication, what we get. Why I have three to four years gap there. That is the reason, you know, we were doing a lot of background stuff just to, because in PhD, I worked on the sensing material like zinc oxide, did a lot of doping stuff, this, that, and when I, I was testing after one month, none of that was working. But I published, I got my degree. Once I got my degree, when I came here, I realized that, yes, okay, what I'm doing that. Now we got this challenge. We've got the challenge to develop a system and system should work for a life, right? Ideally. So how to make the system? Then you have to dig down and see, try to control the fundamental stuff of that particular material or system to achieve very good and stable system. That's my reply, actually, Sunil. Yeah. Non-invasive diabetes monitoring using acetone gas in breath is one of the hot uh, research area. Uh, could you provide your uh, comments or suggestions on this field of research? Yes, that's a hot area. That's why let me tell you that <laughs> my, my Inspire project, actually Inspire, they ask one project for three to four pages or two, 2,500 2, words. I submitted a proposal on those four gases, S2S, acetone, formaldehyde, and ammonia. So of course, <laughs> even I'm doing it, I'm learning also. So I started from S2S, it is kind of over, not everything. Now slowly I have a results of acetone, I have a results of this, I have results of this. These are all basic results. My whole motto is not to, you know, uh, just do the research and publish is I just wanted to utilize because I already have a electronics stable. Why don't we just make a sensor and plug and see that real time application? So there where I understand the basics of what kind of when, what amount of gas you should collect in a toddler bag. Toddler bag, nothing but you collect the breath sample. How much? 10 seconds. Which portion? Okay. What will be the problem if you collect for longer time? What all the gases will come? How it will interfere? What all the moisture will come? Because when you exhale out, when you speak, no? You, okay. You have 95% uh, you know, water mark which are coming from your mouth. And along with those gases like diabetes gases like acetone as you said okay how to remove that moisture and other different gases and get only the acetone detected by your sensor this is open challenge and i'm telling you you know is it is the right time to work on that many people have worked on but not reached that system yes it's a hot topic and everyone is working and i am working also today yeah thanks uh -huh. Uh, the metal oxide is sensing the NO2 gas is it due to the defects uh, so, uh, uh, okay, uh, Suni, uh, can you just let me know that how many uh, questions? Uh, last three more. Last three more, is it? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if uh, some, uh, are you, okay, uh, are, are you able to see some screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I okay, so able. what I'm, you know, if somebody is not able to, is uh, they can go to this profile and, you know, uh, here you have many, uh, yeah. not many, some of, okay. Yeah, and you can just go through, but okay, like how many are there? Yeah. Uh, just uh, three more. And, okay, please uh, tell me. Yeah. Uh, the other question is, uh, can you give some reference uh, for uh, developing the signal conditioning circuit of a sensor? Uh, see, uh, see uh, frankly saying that my area from uh, 2010, I started working on gas sensor material and gas sensor part. I have little bit knowledge of gas sensor i don't work on the system part so there is a team uh, you know uh, i can give you the contact for this you can even contact me i can give the contact there is a, uh, a system team who they work with us 
I, we work from the gas sensor team. The systems team comes, whatever we tell that we need this kind of electronics interface, they do it actually. I, we don't, I don't do it personally. So there is a, so I can give you the content and they can give you very good advice to you. They are expert of that. I'm not expert, yes. Yeah, Sunil? Sorry, uh, can you, can we use any other material other than zeolite? Can you suggest? Uh, so uh, we are, currently we are using some uh, uh, PTFE filters. We are using different thickness PTFE filters. We are using, I mean, PTFE filters, they are majorly used to uh, filter out the dust particles. We are using uh, some uh, different calcium oxide. We are using carbon based material. I have a list uh, this which I submitted during the inspire purpose. I don't remember, but there are the four or five different materials actually uh, uh sorry we are using still yes yeah, yeah. Uh, i think uh, that's it uh, the last question <laughs> is there any standard way of calibration of a gas sensor i think uh, you the standard have... way is like you know you have uh, you have, might have uh, i mean the, the the answer is that you have zero zero gas calibration what is zero gas calibration you put 50 percent rh in uh, uh, N N N uh, nitrogen gas that's the inert gas with 50 percent rh and you see that where your baseline is coming then you do, do five point calibration like five point means you do zero ppm you do let's say you have range between zero to five do zero one two three four five make the algorithm out of it fit it yes that's a that's that's a way of doing the calibration yeah uh, i and, think uh, and yeah. if you want to understand more on that you know how good is your calibration what we have done in the lab deploy it as we uh, you know deploy it along with uh, some standard setup you know if you can yes. if you not then you know you do, do make the algorithm fit into it now your system is ready now you give the gas and let your device tell let your device predict what what is the concentration you are giving okay yeah yeah, yeah. that's it uh, i think uh, thank you very much uh, for the very informative presentation Thanks, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I would like to uh, request Ananta Suresh sir to speak a few words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Chandrasekhar, Dr. Prajapati is uh, yes. really great. I think it was really, really informative, and uh, your answers to questions were also very, very useful. I think a lot of people benefited from it. And uh, for those of you who are still staying on, this uh, recording will be posted on the IASC website. and. Uh, I hope uh, Dr. Prajapati doesn't mind if any of you contact him by email. He has put his email address there. Yes. Is that okay? Yeah. Yes, sir. No problem. Yes. Yeah. I think there are more questions. I think given more time, they would have but already 37 minutes past seven. So uh, I think it is really great. I think you have put together a great presentation. It's a great start for our webinar series. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor. And good night to all. And uh, Professor Veda is always behind all of these efforts. And I thank uh, Professor Revati and uh, Professor Sunil for organizing this. We'll see you in two weeks. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Good night. See yeah. you all. Thank you, sir. Good night. Thank you, Sunil. Thank you, Revati. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Prajapati. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.